Right there are some of the things from your evaluations that you uh, kind of filled in for me. The things that you really enjoyed about the course, uh, ordered up on the right hand side are the things that uh, got the most uh, comments. So I guess lecture was really enjoyed by everyone. Uh, people appreciate the videos and the audio being available, uh, the real application of the material in the class, and that it's interesting. So that's good, good feedback for me to uh, keep, keep doing that. Um, People also really enjoyed the fact that I had taken from a module of learning goals should be for this course, the main range of which topics to cover. And the exercises in the class uh, seemed helpful, and uh, a good number of example problems seemed to be given. And the course organization of this slide. So all of those things over there on the right hand side got uh, quite a number of uh, positive comments. On the left here are some of the uh, things that got fewer and fewer. Uh, so effective assignments, explanations for point demos in the class, use of the technology, uh, people like Google Docs, uh, some, some of you, uh, some of you like pop quizzes and the interactivity in the class. So that's good, good from my side. Um, I'll just come back to that one in a minute. In terms of uh, the the uh, value that you get out of the class and the pace, so I'm glad to see that the pace is about right. So I was concerned that it was a little too slow. Um, so uh, I'm glad that it's, that it's, that it's about that uh, people find this time valuable and the lectures are uh, on that also as keep doing those. Um, regarding the number of hours that you spend in the class, that gives you some guidance of what your peers are doing. Um, so anywhere between two and seven hours spent outside this class per week on the course. And then uh, people do, do use the videos quite, quite a lot. So there's a lot of positive and negative feedback about Google Docs on the left negative feedback on the right and positive feedback. Uh, so like I've said, we're happy to accept regular Word files that you share via Google Drive. Uh, that's going to be an acceptable way of submitting material for this course going forward. Just because people do struggle with using Google Docs, apparently the library is really slow. And, uh, so I, I wanted, I, I, was, I was hoping to use Google Docs just to eliminate paper and to make uh, grading with the TA and myself uh, more, more streamlined. However, we're very willing to, ch to change that if, if the technology is not working, and in this case it's not. So maybe next year or year after Google Docs might, might be at this level that I need it for this course, but right now we'll accept Google Docs if you're willing to put in some time and then put into it, um, or you can just share a Word file on the, on the Google Drive. So we will actually, we will now go in for accept Word files as well. So please do not share zip files and PDFs. Uh, PDFs are okay. Word files and PDFs are okay. But please do not share like a multitude of documents that make up your assignment. So, okay, and then just to come back to uh, this slide here, this is the more important one for me. Uh, things that uh, you have asked for some improvements to be made. Um, so let's just take a look at these. The first one was uh, the most strongly request was to have some more examples with numbers in them. Um, so I, I, will, I will try to work that in, and uh, some people have noted that that has been happening more recently. I did get some, some feedback about that earlier on prior to the evaluation, so I started to do that already. Um, not having class at 8.30 <laughs> is something I would like as well. Uh, I, I, I cannot choose that. That's totally scheduled by people in another part of campus. I have no idea who does the different choices. I have no control, nor does even uh, anyone in engineering. We do not really have any control of the timing of it. So uh, it is what the university schedules it as. Audio in the video, um, I have, I've figured out in my software how to improve that. So I, you should, should notice that the newer videos have better audio. Um, we'll practice questions on the website. I will uh, try to post some of those. I'll probably have a quote given out of this week. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll certainly try to get it as soon as I can. There were assigning questions. Uh, this is something that does come up from time to time. Yes, I know the first assignment had a very big question for one. Um, the more recent assignment, I had some emails about it. And then I, I, a lot of it was just because I realized it wasn't being read. So, yes, yeah, sometimes it is my fault. Sometimes it's also just read it a second time and, and it's not going to be apparent the first time through either. And that's that's, uh, that's something you'll find also when you start working. It's, there's not everything is given to you. You need to make some assumptions. And that's going to be standard in the midterm as well. So let's be clear on that. If there's something that's not there that you feel needs to be given to you, 
you're welcome and should assume, assume it, um, especially where we're relevant. So for example, like the viscosity of water or ambient conditions, those, um, those are assumptions that can be made. If you're designing a sedimentation vessel, a factor of scaling up the velocity by a factor of two, those are engineering judgments that, that can be safely assumed and we will work through, through that key question if you, if you make those assumptions. Um, I've blown in complete lectures. Um, I do have blown in complete lectures, so I wasn't quite sure what that comment meant, but the fact that it came up twice, uh, I just put it out there. So if whoever wrote that, uh, if you could then email me and clarify that, then I will uh, try to address that. Uh, no midterm on Friday at 6.30. <laughs> we had this discussion, but before, there was no other time that really seemed suitable. Uh, Monday to Thursday was out of the question and clashes with everyone else's other courses that you're taking. So unfortunately, we are stuck with that date. So. Um, not too much to do about picking an alternative. Um, there's never going to be a good time that works for everyone, given that this is an elective course and it crosses over the whole year. So, um, not accepting Google Docs, we fixed that up already. The discussion board on the website, I'll look at, um, I, I have not turned off the admin to learn discussion board, so it, that may work. Um, so I'll look at turning, or just seeing if that works for you, and then I'll let you know. Uh, clear a marking scheme, so yes, we have started to put in the, in the more recent assignments the grading allocation, and um, I'll talk about it now as well in the class when, when I go through the assignments here. Some of the more, um, the points that weren't repeated, so these just came up once or twice. Uh, project, more guidance, the professor should choose the project. Uh, no, I should not choose the project, you should be choosing it. Uh, that's very much a part of an elective course, you should research something you're interested in. Um, but I will provide more guidance and post what the project uh, expectations are in the coming week. Uh, notes do not issue changes, reduce slide clutter. Um, let's just talk about those two. Yes, I do update the notes because this is the first time I'm teaching it. I find mistakes in my own notes, I correct them, and I reissue the notes. So it is, that is what it is for those of you who have taken the course, my 4C course, course matter for the first time. If I compare the first year's notes to the second year's notes, then quite radically different, uh, just because I, I always make improvements and continue to do so, which is one of the reasons why I tend to use a wiki style website, because it's, it's always evolving and, and being updated. So unfortunately, you may have to go back and, and, and update your notes, but I feel it's in my interest and your interest to have a correct version on, on the website, rather yeah. than have notes that are never fixed up but remain incorrect. So please, please do try to track, track that. The way you can do it efficiently is as follows. You downloaded a PDF. If you go all the way to the very first page, uh, there is a unique revision number that's at the bottom over here. That's always increasing over time, so it will never, never change. That always just keeps going up and up. So you can always compare your revision number versus the revision number on the website, and that way you know that you have the most recent updates. Um, have a centralized textbook and readings from Gene Coppers. There are readings from various textbooks listed on the website, so for those of you that aren't aware of it, um, if you do go to the website, I have one open here. So here's, for example, the section of memories that we're working through now. At the bottom of the page is a selected list of references with the chapters from the third and fourth edition of Gene Coppers and other textbooks that I feel are relevant for this for this section. So I post the references there uh, well ahead of time for you to have as supplementary readings if you like. Uh, the problem is there isn't a single textbook that covers all of this in, in any, um, all the material that I'm covering in the depth that I require. So for example, Gene Poplis covers membranes very well, but it has almost nothing on sedimentation and cyclones and some computers and uh, with great efficiencies and particle size distributions. Uh, where Cedar Hang and Roper is a good book, it's really expensive, but again, it also doesn't cover some of the topics of sedimentation and cyclones that, to the depth that we, we need it for this course. So unfortunately, I have to use a multiple number of reference books, and I don't want to make all, some of them prescribed. I'd rather just have them all of them as recommended and, and have you, you choose from them as, as needed. So that was my thinking there of not having a single text for the course. Um, Explain terms in each equation in the notes and put equations rather than words. Um, yeah, you do notice that I do put my equations in English rather than mathematics from time to time. I feel that's a very important skill that you need to have when you leave here, is that you need to talk to your colleagues in English, not in mathematics. 
uh, especially your managers who may not be chemical engineers either. So uh, the equations will be put in words and then we'll see them in numeric or sort of symbolic form after that as well. Uh, but I will, I, that's, that's the reason why I do that. Uh, more demos in class? Sure, I can. Uh, things, though, as we progress uh, are impossible, like we're going to cover liquid, liquid extraction and drying, and some of these things I can't always demonstrate, so I will revert, revert to YouTube videos and so on. Uh, use the smartboard. I have tried. My handwriting on that thing is just awful. I really can't write on that uh, smartboard, nor my iPad. Uh, but I, I will try to use a blackboard and write the larger so people can see that. For industry examples, uh, sure, that's, that's easily done. Have review sessions. Try my best. Um, three hours per week is really very limited how much material I can fit in here. So to have review sessions, I'm relying on you to go back to the videos to, to review some of the topics that we uh, didn't, that you may not have picked up the first time. The, and that's the reason, main reason why I have the videos is for you to review. Uh, I, like I said to some of my other classes before, I, I took a graduate course here at Mac. Uh, in 2000 with John McGregor, and the only time I actually really understood the material was when I sat in this class again the second time in 2001. So I don't want you to come back and understand separation processes next year, <laughs> right? I want you to get it right the first time. So that's why I post the video so that you don't have to wait another year to watch the material or see me deliver it to, to understand it. I know myself I get some things only the second or third time I see it. So it's one reason why I make my videos publicly available, so that you don't have to have that delay. You can go tonight and tomorrow or the next week and uh, and get get that review in sooner rather than later. Um, so so I'll, I'll post. I, I keep posting those. Uh, some put, uh, someone remarked that make the lectures downloadable. They are definitely available. Um, just just to show you where if you go to any of the any of the, the things that there's always the audio is an MP3 and the video is an MP4 that's available for you to download and keep for yourself even when you leave Mac. Uh, you can refer to those if you really want to give my course again. More reading material, yes. <laughs> I don't think you want more reading material. The reading material that I've listed there, uh, to put it in perspective, it takes me about eight to nine hours for each hour that I give to you in class. So I read and prepare for about eight, nine hours of reading material per hour I teach. There's too much reading material on the website already, so you definitely do not want more reading material. Um, but I can certainly give you more if you want. Um, assignments make them easier. <laughs> no, that's not going to happen. Uh, this is a fourth year course, uh, so it's going to stay at the level that they are. Uh, grouping seems tedious. Yes, there are um, open-ended questions. You may need to research some topics that we um, don't cover explicitly in the class. So, um, so that, that's going to be a standard feature of the take-home midterm. And uh, take an exam and, and some open-ended questions that you're going to have to think about. Uh, there are too many assignments. Uh, yes, they are too many now. I tend to do that in all my courses. I load up the assignments at the front and then I make them fewer and fewer at the end because the other courses tend to load up your assignments and projects near the end. So I get mine in at the beginning. So yes, there are too many now, but there won't be many. Other. In fact, you're at assignment three and there's only five assignments in this course. So there's only two more left. Okay, so, uh, so that's the feedback. I really appreciate it. If there's anything else uh, that I didn't, uh, that you didn't get a chance to tell me about, or that you have concerns about still, please use the the feedback form on the website, and I'll, I'll address them as soon as I can. Um, so I thought to go through assignment three for, with you on um, some selected questions, just because I know the midterms coming up on Friday, and I wanted to make sure we cover some of this. You see at the same time. So has everyone handed in their midterm? Ah, oh, sorry, their assignment, I should say. Thanks. Okay, so first question. Yes, this is a typical uh, can please don't put equations in words. Sphericity here is defined as words in the course notes, and then you never see it in symbolic form. Um, but it's not hard to convert those words to mathematics. The surface area of a sphere with the same volume as the particle divided by the surface area of the particle. So the denominator is easy. So the surface area of that rectangular shape on object, very easy to calculate the surface area of that symbolically. Uh, it is uh, 2 plus 4x, as you see here at the bottom. 
the new version may be a little bit harder to unpack. Usually when things are in words, work from right to left rather than left to right. So the surface area of the sphere with the same volume as the particle, so what's the volume of the particle? Then calculate the surface area of the sphere that would have that same volume. Well, that requires us to know what the equation is for the volume of the sphere. Uh, Wikipedia will help you over here. What's the surface area of that sphere? Uh, again, Wikipedia will give you that equation. And then you substitute those, those uh, symbolic values in now because you've got 1 and 1 and x for the dimensions of the rectangle. And uh, uh, from the electronic submissions I've seen, uh, most of you got, got to that without any problem. So it does, it does take a little while to unpack that uh, English into mathematics or the more symbolic form that, that you're comfortable with. Um, if, you, if this curve looks a little different to yours, don't worry. I plotted it from 0.1 all the way up to 10. Uh, I, I only asked from 1 onwards, so most of you just got that down the slope. That's the maximum. So this object of 1 to 1 to 1 cube would be the most spherical that you could get is where the peak of the curve is. That's, that's that's an interesting uh, and expected, it is an expected uh, outcome from that equation. What is also very interesting is that as you increase x from 0.1 up to 1, how very rapidly it approaches a very spherical particle and then the decline out takes much, much longer. Uh, so, so that's just a function of how that equation works out. Um, so very, very straightforward problem, very few, few marks that that was 6 out of 60. Uh, so 10% of the time. Next question, um, also relatively straightforward, was just an application of the um, of the sieving idea. So we, we get a, a sample of a part of, of particles, put them through the, through a variety of screens, and we get the mass retained on every screen. And we're asked to calculate the differential curve and the cumulative curve that shows the percentage retained on each screen. These numbers are important for us. They're important for us later on for two reasons. One is uh, we would take this information and go on to calculate the rate efficiency curve, which you did in question five. That's one aspect. But then the other important aspect is that once you've plotted this curve, I'll go through these calculations in a second, is you get your differential and, and cumulative curve. And we're most interested in uh, two features usually of this curve. One is the average. So where is a typical mean particle size? that we should design our processes for, um, or, or that we monitor our processes for. You might be just monitoring the output from the cyclone of the sedimentation vessel. What is the average particle size? Uh, you may also be interested in the maximum particle size coming out of your cyclone, or minimum particle size, depending on what your objectives are with the separation unit. Um, so those, those three vertical lines in the plot are important. Minimum, maximum, and uh, mean, some sort of relevant means that's appropriate for the problem. The other uh, issue that, that might be important for you is the broadness of that uh, distribution. So we look at this purely then from a statistical point of view after that uh, to, to, to use in our, in our problem. So it's important to be able to derive these curves uh, in a correct manner. And so here I give the table. Uh, the calculations are very straightforward. Once you're given the mesh uh, number, you can look at the aperture in microns. Um, we give it the mass retained on, on the screen of that given aperture. Now, for example, that 8.8 .8 grams was the particle size of the material retained on the screen with an aperture of 10.360 microns. But it's the material that's retained on that screen and it, by definition it passed from the screen above it onto that screen. So what we do then is we give the average aperture size to that 8.8 .8 grams. So it's more appropriate than to say these particles on the screen are of size 2360. Well, no, they're not. They're of size 2360 up to size 3350 um, if, if you ran the screening correctly. So we tend to give it the average um, particle size. The percent retained then is the pure uh, percentage of, this, of the prior column. So 8.8 grams divided by the sum of that column. And then the cumulative percent passing is then the 1 minus the percent retained. So so it's uh, very, very straightforward then to get those two, those, those last columns and then they plot them up. So that shouldn't have presented any, any uh, problems to you. <coughs> Question three, again, straightforward. Why is it possible to run these units in any particular orientation? Well, the, the main reason is, of course, that 
the gravitational forces are so much smaller compared to the centrifugal forces that those particles experience. That uh, both in theory on paper you can you can show that, but then in practice you can run your cycle up, upside down and prove that to yourself, which is uh, sometimes counterintuitive because people's thinking is that the underflow in a cyclone comes out due to gravity, and it's not that at all. Gravity is not responsible for taking the underflow in that conical section of the cyclone out. It's purely due to the boundary layer and slower forces over there. As well as you've got the volume of air coming in, being pushed into the cyclone, and it has to go out one of two points, the overflow and the underflow. So you've got the slower tangential forces and slower force, smaller forces at the bottom, and this push, this pressure coming in, um, so the material has to leave there. It's, it's leaving due to those forces rather than gravitational forces. Um, uh, centrifuges are sometimes run in their horizontal orientation uh, purely for stability reasons. And I'll give a bit of an explanation there in the, in the, in the answer that you can then go look up. Uh, I'll put, be posting this later today. Just wanted to spend a bit more time on them on question four was, uh, was we'd seen this example in the class. We've got a very small laboratory separation happening in the centrifuge. And, um, we were asked to calculate the sigma value for it, and then uh, the second part of the question was to say what if we wanted to scale this unit up to a larger size. So, so there's the sigma value for the laboratory size centrifuge, 747 meters squared. The larger centrifuge, the pilot plant scale centrifuge, if you substitute in the dimensions um, for uh, and, and how we operate the centrifuge, we get a sigma value of 5,500 approximately. So remember sigma is purely a, a matter of how you operate that centrifuge omega, and it's a function of the, um, so there's omega over there, and it's a function of the, the geometry of the centrifuge, so the inner and outer radius as well as the height, h. So, so those, um, those parameters define sigma, and then the pilot plants uh, sigma is given and it's approximately 7.3 times the lab size centrifuge. Then the question, so we sort of make sure that what volume of rock can we separate per day? So, uh, so we're looking at how much we can process through that centrifuge in the pilot plant centrifuge. But once we've got sigma on the lab scale and sigma on the pilot plant scale, uh, we can then ratio them relative to their Q cuts. So Q cut on the lab centrifuge is known. We can then calculate through this relationship over here what the anticipated Q cut would be on the pilot plant scale centrifuge. So if we, um, if the ratio of the sigmas is 7.3, then the ratios of the Q cuts is also 7.3. Uh, it comes out to be the same thing. Or you can substitute into the more complicated equation for Q cuts for the lab and, and prove it to yourself. Um, but uh, you, you could then get that Q cut of 8.7 times 10 to the minus 5 meters cubed per second or uh, 7.6 meters cubed per day. So a much greater volume than obviously processed on the pilot plant centrifuge. Any issues? Is, are these numbers agreeing with what you've heard in your assignments? Okay, so you're all happy with that. Good. Then the, the next part of the question was probably one of these uh, questions that I but the feedback, this is not clear or it's ambiguous what you're looking for over here. Um, so the question asked uh, to plot the Q cut versus the smallest particle size diameter at, at selected values of omega. So the thing here is, like, is, is the following is we've got this laboratory size centrifuge and we're looking at scaling it up to a pilot plant centrifuge. What parameters settings do we use on the pilot plant centrifuge? We've got two degrees of freedom, two us. One is the throughput that we put on that given centrifuge, and the other is the speed at which we uh, turn that centrifuge. So those are our two main parameters that influence how we operate that centrifuge. Anytime you change one of those two parameters, you're going to adjust the smallest particle size that you're able to remove from the centrifuge. So that was, the question was saying, was trying to have you uh, plot, a single plot that would show how those two parameters interact and affect that particle size distribution, uh, the particle size diameter dp that you can, you can achieve. So what you could do in practice is you could just plot for a, for a given um, speed, so for a given omega of 20,000 RPMs, 
you could just plot a single line, and that's in fact a solid line over here. So if I run the centrifuge at the very fastest speed that is possible to run at, those are the ranges of particle sizes between zero and uh, just about 0.7 microns that I'm able to, to remove at various flow rates. So obviously, if I uh, go to higher and higher flow rates, I'm putting more material through the centrifuge and with a smaller residence time. So the time of each particle spent in the centrifuge is smaller. And so the corresponding diameter, the smallest diameter that you're able to remove becomes smaller and smaller as well. Uh, now, I could also choose to run my centrifuge at lower operating speeds, purely from an energy perspective. Um, but then again, Lower speeds means that the smallest particle size that I'm able to remove uh, must go up. So I'm putting less energy into my unit. Uh, I'm then obviously going to be able to do less work on work on those particles. They're going to experience smaller forces, smaller centrifugal forces, and so um, the, I'm going to get larger and larger particles out of my overflow. And so this this plot then makes intuitive sense that as I go to higher at lower and lower operating speeds, this particle size diameter. Now, someone like yourself then could use this curve in, in two ways. One is to say, for which particle size do I need to remove? What is my, my limit? So if you're told that you need to remove particles, say, of one micron from your overflow, you can then choose to run your centrifuge at 5,000 RPMs at that, at that flow rate, that volumetric throughput. Or you can choose to run it at higher speeds, but then you get higher throughput through your centrifuge. Or you could go even further, all the way, and run it at 8 cubic meters per day. So you get really high throughput through your centrifuge, but it's going to cost you more money. You're going to have to go up to 15,000 RPM. Okay. And notice that the, the point of this is that there's this parabolic shape to it. You're getting diminishing returns. Right? If I go up to 8, 9, 10 meters cubed over here, um, I'm going to have to then move to higher and higher RPMs. But there's, a, there's a, going to be a trade-off. Yeah, and, and the point is that it's under, this, this is dp squared, so there's a square root over here if you just solve for dp. There's diminishing returns as you go to higher and higher uh, flow rates. Okay, so that's, that's the, main, um, the main outcome that you should interpret from this plot. I didn't ask you to interpret in this question, um, but in the midterm and in the take home, you will have to interpret these sorts of plots and uh, show how you would use them in practice on. Is that, uh, is that helpful, that explanation a little bit? Okay. okay, and then the final question was the grade efficiency curve uh, for, this, for this. The biggest issue that people had was, um, and this, they, this again comes to, the question wasn't ambiguous, it was uh, just read, you just had to read it clearly. Uh, one is, you, you fed a, a stream at 200 kilograms of solids per hour to the cyclone. In the, and then the underflow is 130 kilograms of solids. So then by definition, there must be 70 kilograms in the overflow. So that's how you're operating the cyclone at the moment. Then you sample the streams for a period of time. So you take a small amount from those, and you get those masses retained on the streams for the given sample. People's biggest concern was, well, my feed masses over here, if I sum them up, they add up to less than if I add up my core stream masses. Well, that's quite OK, because these are just a sample of the subset, so your sample size is arbitrary. What you're after more is the fraction that each of those sizes represents. So just ratio those sample sizes, and then multiply them by those corresponding feed uh, flow rates. So, the, so there's the differential analysis if you, if you calculate the size fractions, and then there's a table that shows how those, the grade efficiency is calculated. So again, I uh, use the feed fraction rather than feed masses. Um, you go to feed fraction and the force fraction. Then you get the feed flow rates in kilograms per hour by multiplying that feed fraction with the mass flow of 200 kilos per hour. The force fraction multiplied by 130, and then you calculate the GFX after that. Um, the, once you've got the GFX curve, you read across horizontally. And unfortunately, I haven't plotted it over here. But um, well, let's just take a look if I go back to one of the slides. So, um, so G of X, the way to read it, uh, this is not that, that great efficiency code, but you would uh, just 
read across at 50% and then come down to get the part of the size that corresponds to uh, the rate efficiency of the product. So in this, in this particular example, it was around uh, 300 to 350, depending on, on how you uh, interpret it. Okay, any, any questions on that assignment? That was one of the more straightforward assignments, actually, in my mind. Um, so it shouldn't, it shouldn't have been too, too hard. To uh, get through the, some of the introductory material and then look at the uh, transport equations in the class on Thursday. Um, so, here the focus on ultrafiltration was uh, we're looking at the topic of membranes and we looked at microfiltration last time, which looks at, at larger particle sizes. Now we're moving to ultrafiltration where the particle sizes we're looking at trying to retain are smaller. smaller. So the order of magnitude numbers that you need to have in your mind is really small particles on the order of 5 nanometers to about 100 nanometers, so about 0.1 microns. So ultrafiltration, uh, when I talk about ultrafiltration, one thing that you should be aware of is uh, there's also a topic called nanofiltration. This is really one and the same. The techniques we use for ultrafiltration and nanofiltration are identical. Uh, there's, it's really just that the thresholds of the particle sizes that we look at are different, but the principles of ultrafiltration and nanofiltration are identical. So we will not cover nanofiltration explicitly. Uh, we'll jump over the nano range and go to osmosis, and reverse osmosis, and dialysis afterwards. Uh, but ultrafiltration and nanofiltration very much uh, on the same order of magnitude. The uh, one way to also look at the size of the particles being retained is to judge them. In, the, in terms of the, the size of those molecules, in terms of their number of kilodaltons. So kilodaltons is uh, related to the molar mass of the, of the, of the particles. So the perspective, a hydrogen atom is defined as one dalton, or more, more correctly, actually, dalton is defined in terms of the carbon-12 atom, but uh, pretty much the mass of one hydrogen atom is one dalton. Uh, so what we're looking at here is particles from about a thousand grams per mole up to a million grams per mole. So these are big, big particles. Uh, these are uh, viruses, they're uh, biological particles, proteins, uh, fairly large size particles if you look at them in terms of their molar mass. But if you look at them in the ab absolute size, they're in the nanometer um, range. The falls on the ultrafiltration membrane then, then range between 1 to 20 nanometers. And the typical fluxes that we would get through uh, ultrafiltration membrane, these are the numbers you must have in mind as, as rules of thumb, is on a volumetric basis we get 10 to 50 liters per hour per meter squared. So this is a standard term here, LMH. The LMH of a membrane is the liters per meter squared per hour. Um, we would range in the order of 10 to 50 for, a, for an ultrafiltration membrane. So this is good, uh, a good number to have in mind if you're looking at sizing, sizing these units. The key difference with ultrafiltration membranes over those we've looked at prior is that we're now moving to membranes with an asymmetric structure. So there's a, a second layer here, there's the, the larger pores, and then there's the actual smaller uh, and thinner layer over here with the smaller pores. That's the layer that's actually doing the work. That very thin, layer with the smaller pore sizes is the layer that actually implements the filtration. The larger pores over here are purely for stability. They provide the mechanical strength required for that very small membrane to do its work. Okay, so they're purely there for structural reasons. They're not there to do any of the filtration at all. So that's that's key. The other key point is that it's the ace that thin that thin layer with the smaller pores that faces the feed. So the feed will see that side, and then this larger pores below it, that's purely for the permeates to pass through. Okay, so be clear, on, be clear on that orientation of the, of the membrane relative to the feed. 
and we'll operate these in, um, in almost, well, almost always in tangential filtration mode or tangential flow mode, uh, so that we're, we're removing those solids that will build up on that surface. If we didn't do that, it would just cake up right away those very small type uh, pore sizes. So just uh, some application areas for, for, for the UF. Um, it's, it's used for protein recovery up over there, and uh, high molecular weight material. So we'll call the, the particles that we're recovering the solute, and then the solvent would be the, the liquid phase that carries the solute. So that's uh, some terminology you'll see for the rest of the slides over here. Why are we used for oil and water separations? Uh, so any of those two phases, especially for emulsions. So the oil droplets in the emulsion, these are what I'm referring to here, are emulsions that are extremely stable, emulsions that will never settle out on their own. So if you pass it through a membrane, that oil phase is much, much greater in size uh, in terms of kilovoltons than the aqueous phase or the water phase. And so it's retained while the water will pass through the permeate. Uh, a very common application for ultrafiltration still widely used is in painting cars and painting metal. So to get a very uniform and very corrosion resistant painting coating uh, on car cars, uh, what the companies will do is they put an electric current through the, through the um, paint mixture and that applies it in a very uniformly thick layer to the surface of the metal. So they'll apply that in excess and then they'll wash off that excess paint afterwards, after removing the current. But that paint, those dyes, then are suspended in the, in the, in the, in the water phase, and the pollutants, they can't discharge that to the municipal system. So those paints and dyes have to be removed out. So what, they, what they'll do is they'll use ultrafiltration membranes to pass that feed. The permeate is then obviously going to be an aqueous stream that's essentially free from the paint, and your retentate stream is going to be a very highly concentrated paint liquid solution, which they then simply recycle and reuse again. So if you think of the whole cycle where the, the car company is spraying the, the metal surface, then they're washing it down, so that diluted wash stream with the paint particles in suspension set to ultrafiltration. The permeate then is essentially a free water stream that's recycled and used actually to wash. So the washing that's required purely comes from this recycled permeate. The retentate, the concentrated paint liquid mixture, is then recycled and used to paint the next class. So it's a, it's a close, almost closed loop system that way. And um, I will post an article on the, on the course website about that, that also gives you an idea of the economics of that process. Those, the capital costs for that, uh, for that paint uh, stripping process uh, pays for the, the savings from it, pays for the capital cost in under six months. To, so uh, very highly valuable recovery of the, those paints. Uh, it's used for processing food ingredients also. It's, it's one of the most common uses. So here, uh, egg white concentration, and then here's another integrated flow sheet for whey processing. So uh, for any of you that know the cheese flow sheet, uh, making cheese with this whey that's considered almost a waste product and it's, it's not too, too valuable, but uh, there's some things we can do with it. One is we can't just discard it into the, into the municipal system because the, the BOD of that whey stream is extremely high, higher than municipal, regular municipal waste. So it's not allowed to be discharged. Um, it's also extremely uh, low concentration and so it's inefficient to try and do anything with it and try and transport it around. So we want to concentrate it up um, to reduce the liquid content. So what we'll do is we'll do ultrafiltration on that waste stream first. That gets rid of most of the larger proteins, but then the permeate uh, still contains some valuable sugars and smaller molecules that we then send to reverse osmosis. So we'll see reverse osmosis uh, coming up later this week and next week. Uh, so that's this, this is the first step to removing the whey, and then we'll have a second step to clean up the smaller molecules um, in, in the reverse osmosis. So those valuable then proteins then are then used, and they, they turn into food supplements. They're used as tortillas and bread products as supplements. Um, they're used as an animal feed ingredients. Uh, so whey then gets used downstream. It's, it's of much lower value than, than some downstream products. Okay. 
So, and then the permeate that contains these sugars and salts then gets to the for lactic acid and ethanol limitations. Yes? Uh, biological oxygen demand. It's a measure of how intense the processing is going to be required of that waste stream. So high VODs are under, it means more energy, more work required to break down those biological products. So we'll just done um, on some of the driving force up here. Firstly is the, the pressure drop. So we'll see this is the ultrafiltration is like hyperfiltration in the sense that we use pressure to achieve a high separation. Um, the, just the, there's a note there on the, um, on the membranes, uh, just in case you didn't get it the first time, the tight or the small pore size um, of, the, of the asymmetric membrane is what's facing the particles and the feed. And then that skin layer with the larger pores um, Oh, sorry, the skin layer is, the, is that uh, very thin layer that actually does the work, and then the, the layer below, below it, the open high permeability layer, is purely for mechanical strength. So there's some, some numbers for you just as guidance in terms of the delta P that's applied across those membranes, and in terms of the very small thickness of those of that of that skin layer. Then uh, Hank, Hank Krups in his talk had this uh, slide that showed molecular weights on the x-axis as a function of the rejection coefficients. So let's just take a look at what the rejection coefficient means. Um, it's, it's, it's defined as shown up there on the right. One minus the permeate concentration divided by the feed concentration. So those two concentrations refer to the amount of solutes per meters cubed of solvents. So I'll, I define concentration on the slide coming up next. But it's basically the mass percentage or mass fraction or mass by per unit volume um, of the solutes, the solid particles that we're looking at removing. So generally our permeate, that number should be pretty small if we're achieving the desired separation that we're looking for. The concentration of the solid or the solute in the liquid phase should be low. The concentration of the feed is, is what it is. So if we get that ratio over there to be a pretty small number, we're doing a very good job of separating out the, um, the particles of interest. So high R values or high rejection coefficients are desirable. Um, a given membrane then is defined by its rejection coefficient curve. So this curve over here uh, is two examples given. These would be for two different membranes. Uh, so for a given membrane, we have one curve. What we're looking at is where that curve reaches 90%. And where that curve reaches 90% is the rejection coefficient is what's called the molecular weight cutoff. So this curve over here, uh, where my point is that right now we have an NWC of 100,000. It's indicating that that's the, that's the typical molecular weight of the particles that we can reject 90% of the time. Or conversely, 10% of that molecular weight would pass through to the permeates, is, is the alternative definition. So that the 90% threshold is, is an arbitrary number that's used in, in the membrane industry. Uh, as a, as, a, as a single parameter to, to guide membrane selection. But far more informative is if you're choosing a membrane is not to ask what R is, but to actually ask for this entire rejection curve. So if you're just looking at a crude membrane design, R would be a sufficient number to look at. It's telling you the number where you'd be able to remove 90% of that given molecular weight. But what's more informative is actually the shape of that curve. Because as you can see here, for these two membranes, one has a very diffuse cut. Um, you're not just cutting off at 100,000, you're also going to see other molecular weights passing through the permit and, and being retained in your retentate conversely. Whereas what you would more likely want is a very sharp curve, as steep as possible. Um, this is very similar in interpretation to the grade efficiency curve, in fact. Okay, so, um, except in this case, the number that's widely used in the industry is the 90% value. Whereas for the grade efficiency uh, curve, the, the number that's more widely used is that 50% cutoff. So for membranes, we tend to look at the 90% at the on the rejection coefficient, but the curve's interpretation um, is very much the same. We're looking at the steepness of that and, and where it is along the x-axis. So what you would typically then do is uh, look up at a catalog from membrane supplier
slides, I will uh, post a link to a membrane supplier catalog on the course website, and you can see how they specify these membranes. Uh, one way is by this NWCO phone number, uh, but if you're really more interested in how the membrane will perform for you, you should ask for the entire rejection coefficient curve, or as it's sometimes called, it's also the ceiling curve. So the reason for that name is um, S, that, curve, that number over here, is defined as the ratio of the permeate to the P. That's called the ceiling, ceiling value. And so this is a ceiling curve, showing you the ceiling values across all the molecular weights. And then in Hank's talk, he spoke a bit about how that's the ceiling curve is, um, is, is actually found by membrane manufacturers. So you can review his talk again to see, to see, to see that. Okay, so let's, uh, let's introduce some of the transport phenomena that happen in the membrane here for life for ultrafiltration. We're seeing, as before, with microfiltration, our solutes, the particles, are being carried towards the membrane by the solvent. And those, those particles will then build up here at the membrane surface. So this solid red line is not the membrane, this is just the outside container. The membrane here is actually this dashed red line with the particles building up. We apply a pressure drop, delta P, to, that, to this uh, to the stream, and we're going to achieve a certain flux J. That J is going to be affected by two main resistances. One is the resistance due to the membrane itself, and one due to what we will call R subscript CP, the concentration polarization, or another way to see it is the cake buildup or the boundary layer that's effectively being built up over here by these very small nanometer sized particles. Okay, so here again, like in microfiltration, the resistance due to the membrane is almost negligible. The membrane, uh, the resistance due to the particles themselves is what causes uh, most of the, the, the reduction in flux. Okay. So we'll, we'll see that on the next slide. I'll talk a bit about it. But the key values to bear in mind here are the, or sorry, the key notation is the concentration of the feed, uh, C subscript F, and this concentration of the solute at the wall, C such with W. So let's just talk about those two. And here I've tried to illustrate that a bit um, on this plot. So this plot on the vertical axis, Y, is the distance from the membrane. So this is right at the membrane surface. This is away from the bulk of the feed. This horizontal axis is the concentration of the solid part, so of the protein or of the, of the um, paint or whatever the, the substance is that you're trying to separate from the solvent. So the solute will build up against the wall of the membrane and the concentration of the solid particles over there will be high. So about over here, CW, is the concentration of those particles in kilograms of solute per meters cube of solvent. So when that concentration steadily drops off, it's lower and lower as I move to the, to the left over here, I'm going to decreasing concentrations as I go higher, sorry, further and further away from that membrane surface. So ignore the, uh, this orange, the second curve that now we're just focusing on that blue curve, which gives an ideal type representation of what the concentration profiles are. And what we find then, um, as we saw in microfiltration, is if we increase the pressure, that pressure drop, across the membrane, you'll get higher and higher fluxes. So here's my flux on the vertical axis. As I increase that pressure, I will get higher and higher fluxes in a linear fashion. And that's exactly what this previous equation tells me over here. If I increase delta T, I get a corresponding linear increase in J, given that these resistance are constant. And then just to finish off, what we find with ultrafiltration is that eventually that theory breaks down. We get to a point where that linear relationship does not continue on and on and on anymore but we get a flattening out of that curve. And the reasons for why that flattens out and we get reduced fluxes is what we'll cover in, in tomorrow's class. And we'll look, uh, I strongly recommend actually if uh, you just read ahead and, and review some concepts about diffusion from the master.